Welcome to the panel Places Matter, Empowering Regions in the Global Economy. This is a great topic for progressives because uh, we have been in many countries losing part of our electorate uh, for a very disturbing change we have in our societies. In some regions, some people, they feel disempowered, they feel a high resentment, and this is the outcome of a sequence of crises overlapping, in fact, starting with the uh, unregulated globalization, then with the climax uh, we could uh, reach with the big financial crisis for many years. And uh, during COVID, uh, in many places, particularly in Europe, we went to another approach preventing the worst. But uh, now again, with the aggression to Ukraine and the energy crisis and the risk of uh, uh, rising costs of uh, living standards, here we are again in front of big risk of uh, going further in this marginalization of important groups of our society. So this is a big concern for, for us progressives. And we see that building on these societal changes, we have new political movements emerging and strengthening their positions uh, and even reaching governmental positions. Well, we have, of course, the example of the United States with the election of Trump, now overtaken uh, by Biden, but the risk of a comeback is there. We had also the situation and the trade uh, launch in Brazil with Bolsonaro, and we are going to critical days in Brazil to see if Lula will replace Bolsonaro, hopefully so. And here in Europe, we have this movement with strong positions, particularly in Hungary, where we have the mastermind of this uh, movement, but also, uh, more recently, even in Sweden, a strengthening of these uh, political extreme right parties, and even more recently, in Italy, where we have uh, the outlook of having a prime minister coming from this movement. So this is a very serious concern for progressives. The panel will be about, first of all, to understand how big is this problem. This is my first question for all of you. What uh, can be the, the trends of way, uh, ahead of us? And the second, how should we deal with this? What should be the solutions we should push for? Uh, in order to make the best of our time, because we are starting a bit later, I will introduce each speaker one by one. And uh, I will ask, first of all, uh, Andres Rodriguez Poza, who is professor of uh, economic geography in London School of Economics, to provide us with a general background about the problem. So, Andres, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, 2021 was a good year, not because of the pandemic, in terms of discontent. Mainly because in a country like Germany, the forces that were at the streams, both to the right and to the left, did not make inroads, and it delivered a coalition government of mainstream parties, including progressives. But in 2022, as you have said, we have come back to some routine, and a terrible routine at that. Uh, Marine Le Pen made significant inroads in the French presidential elections. Viktor Orban in Hungary beat a whole spectrum of opposition from the stream right to the stream left, left together united with the biggest majority ever experienced in democratic Hungary, similar levels to a majority that you will get in any communist, former communist country. The Sweden Democrats have got the key to the Swedish government. And just a few days ago in Italy, the Italians have elected the first post-fascist prime minister in Europe since the end of the Second World War. What I'm going to try to give in this uh, four minutes that I have is why is this happening, what are the consequences, and try to give some hints about what can we do about it. 
And the first thing is that there are two, three potential explanations of this. The first one is what the Americans call the cultural wars, the idea that this is mostly an ideological conflict between people that are comfortable with a world that has been changing and has been changing since globalization and people that have lost and feel ill at ease that this like a country that is now much more, that country's much more, let's say, cosmopolitan, that this like uh, the gains by minorities, the gains by women, etc. But on top of that, which is probably true, there's a clear economic explanation. And this economic explanation is very often linked to the decline of many places, and not just a short-term decline, it's a long-term decline, of many places that in the past were often the motors of economic activity, of industrialism in many parts of the Western world, and have been losing out for quite some time. This is something that we have, uh, a lot of people have highlighted, this comes from the crisis, so the 2007-2008 crisis, the financial crisis, the Great Recession, if you want. But we have traced it much more. In Europe, we have data until 1990. We find that places that have been declining since 1990 have turned in big numbers the people, the inhabitants, to these alternatives. We have found it in the case of the United States to decline since the 1970s. And there was a paper published yesterday about Germany in which German researchers have looked at 100 years of economic change and have had a clear connection between economic decline for 100 years and the rise of anti-system, illiberal and populist type of governments. Um, there's also the psychological perception, because there's the reality that you lose in terms of growth, you lose in terms of employment, you lose in terms of industrial output, you lose in terms of population, but you're also dismissed by the, or you perceive that you're dismissed by the elites. There's the whole idea that if we go to the states, these are the flyover states. These are the people that uh, actually have called this bigoted sort of ideas. These are the, in words of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, the deplorables. These are, they are told, the people that don't matter. But they do matter and they have realized, and they have realized that they can matter, especially at the ballot box. So the question is, what are the consequences of this? The consequences of this are terrible because we are electing and this is the whole, there has been a discussion about we in the Western world in previous presentations. What are we in the Western world? When we have Giorgia Meloni, are we going to have Giorgia Meloni as Prime Minister in Italy? When we have Viktor Orban in Hungary, we are not together. And we are electing people that thrive on conflict. Conflict against the other, anyone who doesn't think like them, progressive or not progressive, Anyone who is more democratic is going to be in the opposition and is going to be targeted. Minorities and migrants, but also anyone who is from the outside. You need an external enemy. And Russia chose Ukraine, chose Ukraine. But if you look at the programs of these parties, what we have is that the Italians and the Italians Fratelli Italia or the Lega Nord, they put the blame on the European Union. They put the uh, blame of the, on the Germans because the European Union is a construct for, by and for the Germans, according to them. When you look at Alternative für Deutschland, they say, well, the problem is this profligate Italians and Greeks. And when we go on like that, we don't have a we. What we have is conflict, and conflict, internal conflict in the horizon, and external conflict in order to keep these parties in power, because once they get power, it's very difficult to dislodge them. And this is even in the countries with the biggest institutions, the best institutions, like the case of the US, we saw what happened on the 6th of January last year. So what is the solution? I mean, there are many solutions, but probably one problem, we have a territorial problem. We have a lot of places that have been declining and have been declining by a long, for a long time. In Europe, we have been focusing on the less developed regions, and we have invested a lot on the less developed regions. And that's rightly so. We need to keep on doing that. National governments, by contrast, although they say they are horizontal, when you look at their budgets and how they are spent territorially, they concentrate on the big cities. I work in the UK. 
the region that has received, with exception of Northern Ireland, the most money by quite some margin per head over a long period of time, the last 30 years, is surprise, surprise, not the Northeast or the Northwest or the West Midlands, is London. And London would have done very well even with that support. The ones in between have fallen through the cracks, despite the fact that they have considerable potential. Because some of the most dynamic firms that we have in, in Europe, the biggest and most dynamic firms, actually do very well come from these areas. In Germany, you have the hidden champions. But for example, IKEA did not come from Stockholm or from Gothenburg or from Malmo. It came from Alsfeld. Inditex, the largest uh, apparel company in the world, did not come from Madrid or Barcelona. It came from the suburb of a medium-sized declining city. So there's potential, but these places have been overlooked and their inhabitants have had enough. If we want to address the global challenges, like tackling climate change or standing up to the dictators, etc., we first need to sort our house, to keep our house in order. And that's addressing the problems that might drive us apart and might prevent the combination to actually address the big challenges that we're facing. Andres, many, many thanks for this introduction. We are starting to understand the big picture. But in order to understand the big picture, we need also now to go to the United States. So this is my pleasure to be uh, with uh, Will Marshall, the president of the Progressive uh, Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. And uh, Will, um, we uh, all know uh, the new word, Trumpism. Hmm? Something invented in the United States and somehow exported. But can you help us to understand better the deep nature? Of what is Trumpism? What is Trumpism? <laughs> uh, great question. But I don't think it is an independent phenomena uh, that only exists on our side. Uh, you know, when you talk about these national populist parties and movements that are gaining ground in some places in Europe, not everywhere, not in some countries, uh, I think uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, at the root of it all, it seems to me to be a a working class revolt, a revolt against established political parties, against uh, p mainstream parties that they don't think have listened to them, respected them, or uh, pro uh, oriented their programs around their interests, economic or cultural. So it does seem to me that Trumpism isn't that different from Orbanism, or isn't that different from Maloneyism, or uh, from what the Sweden Democrats are uh, peddling. But what's really worrisome here is that those uh, national populist movements or right-wing nationalism, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, propelled by working class uh, alienation are merging. They're converging with the mainstream uh, conservative parties in many places. I think uh, in, we see that in the Tories in England who have quite cleverly co-opted a lot of the energy from them. But we see that uh, in, in uh, Italy and we see it in Sweden. And What's happening is there's an erosion in the taboo between uh, uh, formerly existed against cooperation with these far right movements, these insurgent movements, and uh, and bringing them into governing coalitions. Meanwhile, the center left is sort of all over the map. We're not, uh, you know, that's why I'm so glad we're here, we're here today talking because we need to get together. The theme of this conference is is just right on point. Let me just two two comments about the challenge, the nature of the solution of the challenge. It seems to me. Uh, the first is that we are very consumed by the question of political geography. If you look at the American map, it's red America and blue America. It's defined by two fault lines, education level. Uh, Democrats do well with college graduates. Republicans do super well with non-college graduates, working class people, and it's geography. We do well in the big cities. They do well in the countryside and the ex-urban areas. And it's not just polarization, it's separation. We are now separating into two different Americas with different norms, different laws. You see this in Texas, you see this in Florida where very conservative governors are uh, banning abortion. And so uh, it, it's, it's like nothing I've seen in this country or since I didn't see it, but it was like the Civil War. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think that's true of the United States as well. But we've got, on the center left of the progressive parties, to find a way 
to make inroads among those alienated working class voters. I don't think it's strictly an economic proposition. In fact, I, in the United States at least, it's mo I would argue that it's mostly a cultural uh, problem. We need to speak uh, to the discontents around immigration, around crime, around national identity, around religion, around gender, around race, uh, in a way that we can have a constructive conversation with these voters who are up in arms. It's not to say to make concessions to nativism or bigotry. We don't need to do that. But we knew, do need to go where they are and talk to them about it. And secondly, we need to have a much better economic offer than we have now, which puts prosperity, economic progress first, whereas I think many of our center-left parties are stuck in the mold of, well, we've got inequality, so we need a lot more state redistribution, massive uh, expansion of social services. I'm not against some of that. But I don't think that's what working class voters are clamoring for. Thank you very much, Will. We understand now much better the, the, the nature of something, in fact, which is spread across the world. But let's now go to UK. Uh, and it's not really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, now as Shadow uh, Secretary of State for Women and Equality. But uh, let me tell you, I cannot forget us uh, together in the European Parliament and you coming with your baby there. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> but uh, really pleasure to have you in this talk. So what can you tell us about uh, the British situation? Well, thank you very much indeed. And I remember those days very fondly and that little baby is now six years old. So uh, you look exactly the same age. I'm not sure that I do, I have to say. It feels like a very, very long time ago, but it's wonderful to be part of this event. And I think as Will said, the time for us to have these discussions is right now. We do see the global right, of course, working more closely together than ever before. So we progressives must really intensify our coordination. And I was asked to comment briefly on the, uh, the, the current situation around regional inequality within the UK and Labour's plans to counter that. And we're starting from a position where our country in the United Kingdom is the most unequal economically in all of Europe, arguably within the OECD on some indicators. Over half of our population lives in areas where living standards are either the same or worse than they are in Alabama, one of the poorest states in the United States. We do see those inequalities of government spending, which actually make those inequalities worse, just as was mentioned. So, you know, for example, twice as much spent on transport in London and the southeast per head than in the rest of the country, particularly the north of England. And of course, that then feeds through into opportunities. You know, we see obviously that talent is equally distributed in our country, but opportunities aren't. And, you know, over 70% of the new jobs that are research intensive that have been created in recent years again have gone into London and the southeast. So there's an immense mountain for us to climb. And it's one which actually I would say, slightly contrary to comments from some others in the panel, I, I actually feel that that mountain has got steeper since COVID rather than the kind of development that arguably we've seen in some countries where remote working has meant people can move into more rural areas. Actually, within my country during COVID, we saw people in the north of England more likely to die from COVID partly because of health inequalities, which mirror economic inequalities, because of labour market inequalities, poorer working conditions, and then also because of an exceptionally poor response from the Conservatives in London to calls from other parts of the country for financial support when restrictions were applied. So we have a huge mountain to climb. We have some very clear negative lessons of what we should not do to try and tackle regional inequality. We've seen two models, arguably, from the Conservatives over the last few years. The first was to talk about dealing with inequality, what they called levelling up. They talked about it a huge amount, but all really that they delivered was some pots of money available on a short-term basis, pitting towns and cities against each other, not integrated with any kind of long-term industrial strategy or plan, not really accountable to local people, and politically gamed by the Conservatives. So, for example, our Chancellor actually obtained some of the funds for his own constituency, which is quite a well-off constituency. It's not one that really required that support. The new Conservative government doesn't even use the phrase 
levelling up. Instead, they are motivated by trickle-down theory. Well, I think everyone in this room knows how well that works or otherwise. Cutting taxes for the best off and for profitable companies is not going to kickstart the growth that we need to see. It has kickstarted an even more intense economic crisis and even a financial crisis as well. That's really quite a record with just a month in office for the new Conservative Prime Minister. So we have a different plan. And we're setting out that plan in a context where there is great cynicism. And, you know, I did agree with a lot of what Will said. You know, people have seen politics failing within the UK, particularly over the last 12 years. And so we must set out a credible programme for change. And our plan is based on long-term measures, based on people and providing power to them. Long-term, saying right now that we will decarbonise our energy by 2030, being very clear about the way we will get there, the fact that the new jobs and the decarbonised jobs as part of that shift will be in those places very often that have deindustrialized, working with business and trade unions to set out that plan. And long-term plans in other areas as well, setting out our fiscal framework, for example, right now, even though we're two years out of a general election, because we want people to know we have that long-term perspective for them and we want businesses and local governments to be able to start planning. And secondly, a plan that's based on people, we know people are our biggest asset, and yet so often they have been left out of these debates and these discussions. And levelling up has often been about a politician in a hard hat stood in front of a new bridge, which hardly anybody uses. It hasn't been about people's real lives. So when we talk about infrastructure, we talk about childcare, we talk about the deserts in so many parts of the country, and we say we'll deliver childcare before school, breakfast clubs, and we say how we'll pay for it. We'll pay for it by scrapping the tax benefits for so-called non-DOMs in the UK, and we'll also deliver extra healthcare staff doing the same. And finally, we're going to have that change by pushing power out and being genuine about that. In doing so, learning from our sister parties, including here in Germany, from previous experience under Labour governments and, by, and from sorry, what we're already doing in government, so in Wales, where Labour is in government, with our metro mayors, our police and crime commissioners, our local councils. Saying, for example, that people shouldn't just have the right to bid like they have currently in the UK. If, for example, a pub is going to close or a village hall, they can bid for that. But so often they just get missed out because some other developer comes along with much more money. We said they'll have the right to buy those facilities collectively to control them through cooperation, to have that mutual ownership of those facilities themselves, providing that power to people. And Gordon Brown, the previous Prime Minister, working with us on those plans, as well as with Lisa Nandy, our responsible uh, Shadow Secretary of State. So we know there's a mountain to climb, but we do believe we can deliver that change. And as I said, in the UK, we need it, arguably, more than many other countries which are already in a difficult situation. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> And Liz, many, many thanks for this uh, insightful uh, agenda for progressives to operate in UK. Now let's go to the last speaker, uh, last but not least, uh, because he is the German uh, Parliamentary <laughs> Secretary of State for Cooperation and Development in the Ministry. So please, uh, Niels, really a pleasure to have your Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating uh, to join this panel. Um, and look, I, I, I think... Um, it's maybe worthwhile to look back a little bit at our own election campaign. Um, of course, the narrative, the agenda changed with Russia's war of aggression. But it's very important to understand, from my point of view, that um, the reason that Olaf Scholz is in the Chancellery today has something to do with the lessons that we tried to learn from the experience of our friends and partners, including the United States. I have rarely seen a top politician in Germany reading so much about the United States um, and trying to understand also in other countries, including our own, what is it that really happened? What caused the disconnect between social democratic, socialist, uh, labor party organizations, parties, um, to lose touch with the working class, basically? There is not 
no no blueprint but i but i do think there are some aspects uh, that we can learn from the campaigns that we run under very difficult circumstances so if you remember the major slogan was respect and so um i am representing uh, a district from hamburg in the german parliament so um, I have been following and supporting Olaf for many, many years. And we, when he was the mayor in Hamburg, he started, and it's just one, you know, out of many initiatives. He started a campaign to directly address those kids who left school without a degree. And we made sure that there would be an offer for them. We made sure in Hamburg that they got connected with... Um, businesses, you know, with the professional vocational training offers that we that we can have. We organized an agency so that they do not need to go from one agency to another. So a one stop shop uh, or one shop stop, whatever I don't know. <laughs> for for vocational training. And uh, and we just celebrated that uh, ten year existence of that. So we need to deliver but we also, and I'm deeply convinced that that is still true, need to think about our own language. Um, we have been talking about, you know, opportunities for young people, and what we meant was academic career. Most of us had an academic career, me included. My, my father uh, is from the working class. Um, and you could sense that they're not against academic careers, but they had the impression, so what we did is maybe second best. That's part of our respect agenda, that every contribution counts. And by the way, with some of the you know traditional crafts job, you can make maybe even more money in Germany with some academic jobs. Um, that's important. The question of inequality and the sense of being left behind it's not enough only to address it. We need to work on our own language, but we need to deliver. And most of you, I think, listen to uh, Wolfgang's uh, discussion here on the main stage about the war and what we're doing. Uh, there is a connection between the 100 billion package which we put into an extra budget and our national agenda in delivering on raising minimum wage, on investing in education, investing in better services from the public sector, because it's enabling us to continue, even under these enormous fiscal pressures, to do just that. And, and I believe that's important. And it's important to fight for the right of everybody, um, of minorities, you know, who are disenfranchised. But it's also important not to tap to, to, into the trap of the conservative culture wars. So that's why if you um, analyze our election campaign um, in detail, we almost, I, I don't know completely, but we, we, we almost completely avoided the cultural wars, you know, about language, about certain symbols. And that's an important message to those who are leaning towards the right wing, but are not made up their mind yet. And, and I think that's part um, of an agenda that, I mean, it was not an overwhelming victory, so we should be, you know, modest. But it, it enabled us, it enabled us to win back the, the voters from the working class. And we did that. Uh, when Olaf was the mayor, and we continue doing that now on the federal level. And, uh, and the, the point is that we need to do additional you know, heavy lifting, but if we lose track of that agenda, then we probably lose those part of the electorate in the long term. And that's why it's so important. My last point, yesterday, a summit on affordable housing. So you would be surprised about maybe the agenda you know, of the government in midst of a war, but that's what we need to do. We need to show that we are able to do both, deliver on our, our promises and support Ukraine. And I leave all the international cooperation out because um, we're running out of time, but 
that's also important to look at, you know, a basic social protection flaw on investment in healthcare, something that enables people to make a good living in the regions where they live. Uh, Niels, many, many thanks for these uh, lessons you are bringing to us, because I think they are really important. First, to avoid to fall in the trap of cultural wars, big trap indeed. Second, uh, to go straight to the, finally, human dignity. Uh, and that's the meaning of the Respect World uh, SPD campaign has launched, and now we are adopting uh, among the progressive family. And this is really a very important uh, uh, approach we need to uh, implement in many, many poli policy areas, housing, wages, uh, uh, child care, everything. Now, let me use the second round where we need to be shorter because uh, I'd like to give also the opportunity to have questions coming from the floor, on provoking a little bit the panel on the situation now and in the next uh, period. Because we are dealing with this kind of perfect uh, storm, the combination of warfare, climate crisis, need of stepping up energy transition. And uh, I would like to have your input about how to deal with this situation in order to prevent the risk, because basically we are in a crossroads. Will this perfect storm become a chance for extreme right movements or a chance for us progressives? This is the big question, okay? So I would say, well, warfare uh, involves also using energy as warfare, which is the case now energy blackmail. Mm. But we can argue as progressives that in the end, to be greener is to be safer. To be greener is to be safer. It is for sure. But that's for sure on the longer term. But now the short term. Because the transition is the difficult thing. Mm. And how can we make the transition to this better solution, greener and safer, while preventing social inequalities? Because the risk is there. This is the challenge for us progressives. How can we deal with this? We understand this uh, has to do with investment, including social investment, uh, but how can we really provide this uh, really new way to deal with the, the perfect storm? So let's start again with uh, Andreas. Ma Maria, I, yes, I, I am so sorry. You have your limit. Um, so let's start with you. Yeah, no, I am I'm, I'm, yes, sorry to jump the queue. I, you are, you we know. are a little late and my, my schedule is <laughs> <laughs> um, Very well. So, so I, that you can I, maybe I can, reasoning. because then I have to leave, unfortunately. I just, sure. with your permission, <laughs> I just wanted to say um, my experience in dealing with our partner countries, and we are just days away from COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. And, and Germany is developing what we call the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. And two words are important here, partnership and just energy transition. Um, and I think we need to talk about our own experience. We are doing that here. Uh, we have made, I mean, it was very messy negotiation about Germany's law that is, you know, giving us the um, legal ground for exiting coal. Uh, and it includes billions of investment in those regions that are heavily affected, giving security to communities, um, giving the ability, you know, for long-term investment for businesses, but also for the local leaders, which were all, you know, negotiating with the federal government. So I know that if you look at the per capita investment we are making into especially Eastern German communities, we cannot replicate this for South Africa, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, and other countries. But we need to mobilize together the resources. And that's why the social aspect is so important. And if, if I can leave you with that thought, to insist on science is correct, but it's not helping you to implement what's necessary. So if you ignore, you know, the social aspect of that incredibly difficult transition, 
then I'm afraid we are lost. And that's why I believe, you know, I have huge gratitude for the green movement and the ecological movement that were ahead of its time, pushing us in the right direction. For the implementation, we need, you know, that progressive understanding for social equality and the equilibrium. And I hope that in spite of Russia's war, we will be able to compartmentalize and to maintain the level of engagement and cooperation that is necessary, even with difficult um, actors, to make progress on that front, because time is running out, and unfortunately also my time. So thank you very much. Yes, many thanks, and also for... Thank you very much. And for bringing this international dimension to our talk, because we progressives also need to take care of this. Thank you, Juan. So let's now go to Andreas again. Well, thank you very much, and I think that Niels has summarized, uh, summarized it very, very well. But I, I want to highlight uh, a few things. The first thing is that you ask the question, is this a challenge of an opportunity? It is an opportunity for progressives and for all Democrats. I wouldn't like to live it to progressives. Mm -hmm. uh, liberals, Greens, people in the Christian Democrats, all Democrats, it's an opportunity. But it's also a massive opportunity for the parties at both streams. Yeah. So the question is how you play, how we play our cards. Okay. And we need to play our cards well. And I'm going to put a contrast between Germany, where we are, and the three other big countries in Europe, the big economies, the United Kingdom, uh, France, and Italy. Um, over the last 30 years, the United Kingdom was, at the beginning, uh, the, one of the most equal big countries, now is the most unequal, both interpersonally and interterritorially. Uh, in France, over the last 30 years, there has been only one region that has grown above the average, which is the region of Paris, the de France. All the rest, better or worse, have done worse. And in Italy, what we have is that in the north of Italy, where you have massive discontent, they are still rich. But over 30 years, more than a quarter of a century, there have been only the province of Milan that has grown. Turin has been around there. All the rest are poorer than they were in real terms than 30 years ago. By contrast, in Germany, is a more evenly spread sort of welfare. The big cities, Berlin, the Ruhr, the two biggest agglomerations, have not done particularly well, although Berlin is starting to do much better. And wealth has been spread because there's dynamism everywhere else. So the question is, what do we need to do? And although Will said in the United States is, a, is more of a question of cultural wars, and I probably agree with that, or I think the economic part it plays an, an important part, I think what has been done by the SPD here is important. Learn. Learn from what were the mistakes in the past. This is what Labour is doing. It cannot, we cannot go back to the situation in 2019 in which Labour votes to a large extent were confined in rich areas of London, and they were completely lost in the north of England. So we need to think about sorts of policies that actually intervene. But I will warn against one thing. This is not about throwing money. It's not about throwing massive amounts of money. It's not subsidizing. This is what Larry Summers and uh, Ed Glaser have been proposing for the US. This is what Italy has been doing in the Mezzogiorno for 50 years. This is what France is doing with Corsica. And what is the result? More discontent. What we need is to actually listen to the plights of these people, look at the potential that these places are, work with them and empower them, because this is not what leveling up is about by the conservative government, to actually maximize their potential and allow them to connect to an economy that has changed radically. And the big advantage if we play our cards relative to the illiberal populist parties is that we, as Democrats, can work together transnationally to combat the big challenges. They cannot. Yeah. Because they think yeah, looking at their own belly button and saying, how can I stay in office? And if I have to pitch myself against a similar like, uh, minded party in another country, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Let's go to Anne-Lise now and then conclude with Will on the eve of the elections in the United States. So, Anne-Lise. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an incredibly important question. and. Certainly for us in Labour, it does boil down to empowerment 
I would say in two directions. So, first of all, arguably, within my country, there's an incredibly high degree of cynicism around industrial change, because in the UK, industrial change has tended to simply mean deindustrialization. So many promises over the years, hardly ever realized, jobs lost, places becoming those which people feel they have to move out of in order to move on. So there must be a credible plan and it can't be more of the same. I agree with what was said. It can't just be about money, which isn't accountable to local people going into different areas. It needs, for example, to always be allied with strong working rights. That's why we've already set out a new deal for working people where there are new jobs or decarbonized jobs. They must be decent jobs that people can actually bring a family up on. But then in addition to that, we need to make sure that where there are companies coming in, they actually have a responsibility to the local area. I mean, procurement within the UK has not been used to support local skills and jobs. It's been something that comes into an area and then goes away again. So that must change around power, first of all. But then secondly, we on the centre left, we have to be the voices of hopeful change because we'll only find division on the right. And we have to be the ones who say it will be us as social democrats who will harness those mechanisms for greater power in communities. And I've been running our policy review for the Labour Party. We called it Stronger Together because with new technologies, we can have better coordination and work together better than we've ever been able to before. We had a terrible COVID period, but we saw our communities working together in a way that's going to be critically important for the circular economy, for decentralized energy production and distribution. So we need to be that forward-looking voice in empowerment saying, we will deliver that future and you'll be in the driving seat. You won't have it done to you. It will be with you and driven by you. Thank you, Annalise. And now, United States. Well, thank you, Annalise, because I, I want to pick up on your point about hope. It's so fundamental to uh, uh, what's been missing in the progressive message to working people. Since the 2010, 29, 2010 crisis, we've been feeding them a narrative, and it's a narrative of uh, scapegoating. That is, you're badly off because rapacious corporations and the wealthy have done you wrong and done you dirty. And, and there's some truth to that, but that, you know, for, it's led to the most pessimistic account of the economy that we could possibly be talking about. So we, I think, have been missing the mark when we go to the working class voters and say, here's a better uh, economic offer that meets your needs, because what they hear is, uh, join us in feeling like a victim. They don't want to feel like victims. They want to, what they are looking for is the, a place in the new economy, not in the old economy. There's a lot of nostalgia in the United States for the factory economy. We're going to bring it back. Even, even our president sometimes talks about that. But what he's actually done is to pass important measures on clean energy and on infrastructure and on rural broadband that would bring working class people outside the big cities in, and connect them to the new economy. And I, if news was here, I would emphatically agree with his point that uh, this includes, uh, you know, equipping people with the skills that th these new jobs uh, uh, demand, which we do in a very, we're probably the worst in the Western world in terms of some systematic way of doing that. So uh, it's economic aspiration more than redistribution or distributive justice, I think, is the message now we need to offer to these voters. And the Biden administration, the president to his credit, has passed a lot of things, which unfortunately will not be felt in time for this midterm election coming up in two weeks. Uh, but a lot of things that are going to really change the material circumstances of workers. Out there in Ohio, northeastern Ohio, you know, there's a real prospect now of taking the old car industry and turning it into electric car industry. We put uh, now billions of dollars into catch, closing the gap with the Chinese, who frankly are ahead of us in electric cars, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're going to try to catch up uh, resolutely. So it's that kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of a green industrial strategy. Uh, but it's tied to a message uh, of aspiration and upward mobility for those voters, not retribution against 
pass injustices. If I could say one other word about energy, and I'll desist. Uh, look, uh, this 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 crisis has been a a, a clarifying moment, and I think a, a reality check for a lot of our friends on the left who envision a, a, a frictionless and very swift move down the clean energy path. Uh, and you know, right now the United States is uh, exporting uh, gas to uh, Europe and to Germany, and we want to do a lot more of that. Uh, and we want to see the United States become something like the energy arsenal of democracy, as Russia pulls, pulls, you know, withdraws, and as Europe says, no more to Russian gas. So uh, as we make this transition, you know, we, we need to have a politically sustainable path that voters will uh, support because they, they won't feel that they're going to be faced with scarcity rather than energy abundance, which is what they want, high prices and unreliable supplies. Thank you very much, Will. I think uh, bit by bit we are starting to um, uh, identify a possible progressive message to deal with the situation. Uh, I was told in the meantime by the organizers that we have uh, some more 15 minutes, so we should conclude a quarter to two, isn't it? Which uh, allows us to go to the, uh, the participants. And I will launch uh, now this uh, possibility. While I will uh, complement what was just said in, in the following terms. Um, we understand that it's very important for progressives to generate the jobs of the future to offer a real alternative for those who feel marginalized and losing these possibilities in different regions. This is certainly a big part of the progressive response. Nevertheless, if we take into, into account the concerns with living standards, not about jobs, but also living standards, uh, and access to uh, basic uh, welfare uh, possibilities, uh, we see that there's also a big source of inequality. Mm -hmm. And uh, this happening not only with the uh, old kind of activities, but new ones. We have a big discussion across the world and across Europe about how to deal with platform work. Millions of people, and particularly young people, are now in these kind of jobs, which very often don't have any kind of rights, hmm? including access to social protection. Hmm? So um, my question, just to, for us to go on with the talk, now with the audience, is that uh, perhaps from the progressive side, we need to work for jobs for the future, but also setting a basic uh, level of uh, social rights which should be really um, real mm, uh, across our territories. And from this viewpoint, what you just said is very interesting, because why Germany is particularly successful in relative terms when we compare with France or Italy or what? Look, my explanation is that you have a certain kind of federal system in Germany, which has many weak points, but has a quite powerful per equation system. Hmm? And uh, in spite of this, the problem is also there in Germany, but uh, in, in, let's say, in the, in the shorter margin. Uh, so mm, we also need to understand what is the political system and the welfare system behind these situations. And the welfare system is for us, the progressives, to invent the new phase of the welfare system for the 21st century, should be able to deal with these kind of uh, uh, new challenges we are just identifying. Well, with this uh, short introduction and all the great uh, discussion we had in the panel, let now go to the uh, participants and inviting you to come with your comments and the questions. Please be brief, but you are very much welcome. So who wants to come in? Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry because I need to check. I was told that we have until quarter to two. <laughs> and I, I got the yes. So I need the organizers to tell me what is the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So who wants to start? 
Hi, my name is Liz Wilkie. I'm from the United States. I'm a labor economist and future of work researcher. Um, my overall reaction to this discussion is thank you and yes and. I think that the systematic reinvestment in these areas that are declining and to see those jobs come to fruition and to provide those services is the work of decades. And I think that the immediate threats of the mobilization of uh, the political sentiment in these areas is not something that we can wait that long. I have a sort of two things that I'd like you to react to. One is that I don't think it's a coincidence that the rise of these movements after the financial crisis also coincided with the maturation of Internet 2.0, which is predominantly based around social media, the sharing of stories and the mobilization of action around those grievances. And what is the strategy or what is the space to create a comprehensive communication and social media and storytelling strategy that is equally um, effective towards changing the nature of this conversation that is already that is already developed and then I also would like you to respond to the idea of um, an expanded definition of fairness which I think includes equity and opportunity but also I think includes issues of accountability I think that a uh, few people uh, systematically erased trillions of dollars worth of middle-class value during the financial crisis and not a single person, save one middle manager, went to jail. And I think that beyond issues of good jobs, there are issues about accountability and fairness and the idea that the same rules apply to everyone. And I think that a lot of people in these areas do not feel that the same rules apply to everyone, especially the rule makers, as we are simultaneously telling them that they do. I think that that's less of a problem for conservatives because they do not rest on rhetoric about institutional ideals and progressive values uh, that, are, that are based there. So it makes us look like hypocrites and it makes liberal democracies look hypocritical to continue with this rhetoric without holding that accountability which relates to that larger view of fairness and I'd like you to comment there. Thank you. Many thanks for bringing this uh, question. Uh, two questions in fact. One about the impact of uh, social uh, fairness in taxation. So uh, how is this perceived and this is feeding in this uh, new disconnection we are commenting in this panel. And the second is the role of media in um, limiting the capacity of our democratic systems really to uh, address the problems and to come with a real democratic solution. So many thanks for the questions. And uh, I have now this gentleman Second row, please. Thank you, uh, Thomas Schneider from DFK, Chairman Association of Managers. As we have two representatives living from UK, in the UK, or Great Britain, whatever you prefer, I'm tempted to ask you about the, uh, the, the uh, risk that uh, from Great Britain would uh, end, uh, end of this uh, decade, maybe in Little Angular having in mind that uh, Ninja Sturgeon, the uh, first minister in Scotland, is fiercely going for a second referendum, and uh, hopefully, in her terms, um, leading to a separation of Scotland from the from UK. And uh, in a similar, on a similar path, there are, uh, there are some rumors that Northern Ireland could be separated from the from, from UK if the, the uh, clash with the U um, European Union on the, the uh, borderline uh, between the European Union and, and UK would not be successfully solved. So my question to you both, what is the uh, progressive approach to keep this country in one, as in one statehood? I think everyone is, is thrilled, apart from the Scots maybe, to keep it in, in, in one, one entity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Other questions coming from the floor? This is a bit in the shadow, but uh, yes, please. Oh. Sorry to grab the mic there. Okay. So I'm an American living in Germany. Uh, I found some of your framing of economic first incentives uh, interesting in terms of what we're looking for in terms of empowering people. So I'm wondering in terms of the progressive messaging here, in terms of reorienting our conversation around other more comprehensive goals, uh, seeing that you know economic first incentives don't always work out and there's a lot of people who are left behind, not just in these you know, areas around the world, but also in the energy conversation earlier. So I'm just curious about reorienting that conversation about goal setting. So 
there are some comments there about that as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, now I will ask a reaction from the floor. So you pick whatever the questions you want to pick. In the meantime, we still have time for a final round of questions coming from the audience. So who wants to start? Annelise? Happy to. I think it's my <laughs> turn. And they were so stimulating questions, but I'll try and be really brief, maybe first of all, about the, the UK's component parts. Um, I mean, first in relation to Northern Ireland, the UK Labour Party has always sought to be an honest broker in relation to Northern Ireland. We obviously performed that role, arguably, to quite some success when we were in government. We've continued to do that. We've been urging the UK government and indeed the EU to be sitting down listening to those particularly business voices, but civil society voices as well in Northern Ireland. It feels like we may be edging towards a better situation around that. Just over the last couple of weeks, it feels like there's been some steps forward, but you know, we're not complacent. We're, we're hoping that we will get that resolution. When it comes to Scotland, of course, Nicola Sturgeon is pushing a referendum, but without Scotland being behind her, you know, about 70% of Scots are really clear. They do not want to have a referendum right now. They don't want to have a referendum in the midst of a cost of living crisis and indeed a crisis in public services and in crime and many other problems hitting Scotland that the SNP has failed on. So, you know, we're confident that we can be making steps forward in Scotland. And in fact, Labour has been. So we've been moving forward in, in Scotland, which has been great to see. Then finally, the, the points at the, at the back, I would say, first of all, that on some of these issues, we feel we can move forward quickly. You know, we've said with our New Deal for Working People, we want to enact that within 100 days of a Labour government coming to office. And yes, it will take some time to make that change. But in the context of what um, Maria just said, you know, we've seen low unemployment, yes, in the UK, but 12 years where living standards have been constrained. And inevitably, people are quite right to be angry about that situation. But we know what can work to turn that around. And actually, we've seen recently how, for example, trade unions working with business can start to quite radically shift and improve people's living standards. And that's what we want to be backing uh, in government. And then finally, I mean, this is, isn't, I'm, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about campaigning in other uh, sessions during this conference. But again, we're finding that when we are actually showing people that respect, when we're speaking directly with individuals about their concerns on some of these issues, that's been very powerful for us on the centre left as it has indeed for those on the right and far right. So certainly the Labour Party now is doing far more around, you know, what we call real voices, you know, actually speaking with people, reflecting their sentiments, which are the same sentiments as those that motivate us as Labour Party activists as well. Thank you. And Liz, do you want to come now? Sure. Uh, American. Well, uh, Liz, you put some really heavy questions on, on the table and would require a whole other session to really do justice to, but just two, two remarks. Yes, the social media revolution is, uh, has abetted tribalism and uh, helped uh, communities uh, of uh, you know, uh, people with odd views find each other and, and uh, create their own separate realities. There's been an epistemological crisis where people can choose their own realities, not just their own political parties and other sides. So uh, it's a really difficult problem to know how to solve. Uh, and it, but it has, to, I think that the whole discussion about, you know, the, the management of content uh, and the filtering of it that we're having now is, is you know, points in the, the right direction. It's a really complicated dis discussion and we don't, you know, uh, not being drawn into a world of censorship is really important. Uh, but having uh, stronger safeguards against the uh, the spread of both, you know, of false information and information deliberately intended to incite is uh, important to me. Secondly, you know, I, I, I'm with you on accountability. I wish more, uh, you know, mortgage arbit arbitragers and housing uh, people and, and, and Wall Street people had gone to jail after the 2010 <laughs> crisis. It would have been an accountability moment. But at this point, I don't think uh, that, it, you know, uh, Donald Trump and the and the and the right, the national populists, are maestros of resentment and anger. We'll never beat them in that category uh, because they will say anything and incite uh, hatred and tribal divisions. To, that's exactly what Trump does. 
we really need to offer a message of hope and uplift to folks that haven't heard us talk to them in a generation. Our economic policies, frankly, in the Democratic Party are still way too oriented around the college-educated uh, people who are such an important part of our base. And they're not ori oriented around the working-class people who are not now an important part of our base, but with whom we need to do better if we're going to build stable governing majorities and do them or anybody else any good. So it does strike me that that's the priority. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, a lot of very, very interesting questions. I'll skip the one about uh, the UK since I'm the non-British part of, uh, although I've lived there for 28 years, my children are British, but I'll skip that one. I'll concentrate on the idea of uh, this is long term, what can we do in the medium short term and the fairness part. Um, I'll start with the long term. Um, the long term is made of daily short terms and we have to keep on doing short terms in order to make sure that we get to where we want to get in the long term. And we have, in the case of the United States, where we come from, uh, my analysis has traced the brewing of discontent, the additional vote to Donald Trump in 2020 and in 2016, to decline since the 1970s. Now my question is, what did Jimmy Carter, and I'm putting precedence from Republicans and Democrats. Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bush Sr., uh, Bill Clinton, uh, despite the fact that he came from the South. Uh, what did um, uh, Bush uh, Jr. and Barack Obama and, despite all his rhetoric, Donald Trump do for these declining industrial areas, these areas that were left behind? The answer is absolutely nothing. We have to go back to Roosevelt to find a president that actually did something, and now, starting the short terms, very much under the radar, Joe Biden has decided we are going to do something because we know that otherwise we're going to have, and you highlighted it very clearly, a very divided United States. And the good thing is, is focusing not on redistribution, is focusing on opportunities, on tapping into potential that has been untapped for decades because of lack of attention. And this is the right way to go. The problem is, of course, we have a short-term problem. That is, in 2024, the US elects Donald Trump, then all this will unravel. So we need to act very, very quickly. And here we can learn from what happened, for example, in France. In France, there was a perception of unfairness. The question, in my case, I don't think is about fairness or unfairness. I want everyone to prosper. And if people prosper more, fine. But everyone has to prosper and has to have a minimum sort of level so they can develop their talent and have the opportunities wherever they live. And then let them grow. The problem in France is that many of these people felt that their talent was being wasted, that all the policies were being done by a small elite in Paris, mainly, mainly the Narcs, that actually rule for themselves. And then what you had is the revolt of the Gilets Jaunes, for example. You have a diesel tax of people that have been told 20 years ago you have to buy diesel because it's the way of the future. And they have seen since then their schools disappear, the public transport go, everything else, whereas people in France, in, sorry, in Paris, and I shouldn't make that, in Paris, have world-class transportation that they cannot use. When did the revolt stop and it might reignite? When finally, President Macron decided to go down and decided to talk. And talk and listen to the people. And say, we listen to you and we're going to, actually, we understand your plights and we are going to work with you to find a solution. That's the psychological part. That's the thing that we're going to be fairer. Because when you look at how money is being spent, very few countries publish how the money is being distributed, public money, public investment, distributed territorially, because the reality is that it's not very flattering for many of these areas. So what we need to do is combine this, the long-term perspective by starting today, because otherwise the long-term will always be the long-term, and also try to work in collaboration with the people that are being felt and 
not just felt left behind and in reality left behind, but also with the people that uh, to try to promote their potential because there's a lot of new ideas and activities coming from there. Just one question, one answer on, yeah, on, uh, on, uh, on the internet and internet too. The people that are revolting are not the ones that are on Twitter every day. They are the ones that are less on Twitter. So their plights and their problems are not fabricated. They're real. So we need to address them. Thank you very much, Andreas. So uh, in fact, uh, we now need to conclude. And let me just conclude with a, a remark which is cross-cut our great panel. Uh, starting from the example of uh, Roosevelt in the United States, because this was a, exactly a, a game changer, this new deal. And now we have uh, packages being proposed by President Biden, hmm, which are still underway to meet the, the ground. And in Europe, we invent something new to deal with COVID, exactly to ensure that there is a basic level we can guarantee for everyone. You don't, don't lose your job because you are under pandemic. This was very clear principle and powerful. Uh, but now we need to invent a new one for the crisis which is there coming uh, with the energy transition. Mm -hmm. And this is, I believe, the task for us progressives. Uh, but I also hope that the panel could come with uh, good ideas for this. And many thanks for the panelists and a round of uh, applause. And uh, we'll go on working exactly with this purpose. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much. That was a great panel. Uh, and uh